Welcome everyone to another episode of the SBA show. Today we are joined by Samuel Wines from CoLab Australia. For those of you joining us for the first time, my name is Hamish White and I'm one of the founding members of Sustainable Bills Alliance and the director of Sanctum Homes and I'll be your host for this evening. In the spirit of reconciliation, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Now, I do have a bio here from Sam and I'm going to say a lot of words here which I think I understand and I'm hoping that Sam can then further explain what it all means uh, in his presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, we are joined by Sammy Wines from CoLab. Um, Sam has a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a Bachelor of Commerce in Management and HR. He is a transdisciplinary thinker, exploring pathways towards a future where we can meet the needs of humans whilst respecting our planetary boundaries. Informed by nature's principles, he works to weave biological, cognitive, social, ecological, and systematic insights together to support regenerative design, development, and innovation. He's the co-founder of CoLabs, a transdisciplinary in, in innovation hub and biotechnology co-working laboratory that is catalyzing the transition towards a more circular, bio-based regenerative, regenerative economy. ProLabs provide access to enable infrastructure and startup support services for Australia's growing bio-based and bio-inspired innovators and entrepreneurs via a simple fee-for-service business model. I uh, just want to have a shout out to one of our platinum sponsors, uh, CSR Bradford. Uh, you can check out all their range of products at csr.com.au. Uh, today's webinar, like normal, is going to have a short presentation from Sam and then we're going to jump into a QA. and a uh, We already have a bunch of questions uh, relating to the topic we're going to cover today. Um, but if you do have any questions, please throw them in the chat box and we'll try and uh answer them uh towards the end samuel i'm gonna throw over to you mate brad thanks so much um yeah also would like to start with acknowledging um the traditional custodians of the lands on which we i guess run and operate our business um the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin nation i'd just also like to acknowledge their continuous connection to country and the fact that they were the first innovators and scientists on this continent uh, there's a lot we have to learn um, and a lot we can do to collaborate with them to try and bring things like biomaterials uh, to the mainstream. So, yes. Um, yeah, so biology to buildings. So this is a really fascinating topic that I guess actually is kind of one of the key reasons why we kicked off CoLabs as a, as a company was, I guess, my innate interest in uh, trying to find better ways to create environments for humans that are more like an actual environment and less like a machine which has kind of been the dominating sort of logic and worldview and ways of approaching design is very utilitarian and very even with human-centered design right it's um it's human-centered it's not ecocentric or let alone planet-centric so yeah i guess that's where a lot of the interest and impetus came from was being very fascinated by things like regenerative development and design and seeing the fact and the way in which biology can be uh, form of technology and can be applied in this context. So, uh, where are we? Well, Haim gave us a better intro than I could ever give to ourselves, but I'll still do my best to sort of work through some of these things with you just so that you kind of understand what we mean. Um, again, it's not that we try and use big words to confuse people. It's just that sometimes using large words or the specific sort of word is essential for us to get the point across about what we do. So the reason why we say transdisciplinary innovation is because uh, a lot of the problems that we face in the world right now are due to the fragmentation and the segmentation of, uh, I guess, our thinking and our way of looking at the world. So yeah, I guess all, we're really, really good at doing the, the small mechanistic linear sort of things and that reductionist framework and way of looking at the world is great. I mean, that's why we're here. We have satellites in space because of it. It's awesome, but what happened during that process since the scientific enlightenment is we lost our ability to perceive the whole 
uh, at least when we talk about it academically or in an innovation context, right? Like, I feel like intuitively people understand this. Um, so I guess from our perspective, transdisciplinarity is looking at ways in which we can remove this concept of here is business, here is law, here is science, you know, and recognizing that it's all a coherent whole and that it's actually that separation and isolation which is causing a lot of the problems that we face because designers don't interface with ecologists or biologists and you've got biologists that are trying to do science and they're not thinking about psychology and the way in which humans behaviors and patterns and ways of relating are going to impact what they're trying to do from a sustainability perspective. So that's why we're sort of looking at that transdisciplinary sort of stuff. Biotech's kind of straightforward. It's looking at using living systems as a form of technology, um, which is, I guess, different to your conventional forms of technology because it's much more of a collaboration when we're talking about working with living systems. These things uh, quite literally have a mind of their own. Um, or at least maybe not a mind in the way in which we think of a mind as like self-reflective consciousness, which is what we we have as hominids, but more so like um, they adapt and respond to their environment. And that is also what makes these things incredibly fascinating because what that means is that as designers and as builders and as people who are looking at working with this sort of stuff, we need to be thinking about it as a collaboration with a living system rather than a command and control or how do I force this thing to do what I want. Um, I guess that sort of way of thinking is not really fit for purpose when it comes to working with living systems. Um, so yes, then yeah, the circular bio based and regenerative economy, that's kind of, I guess, speaking to this notion that when we look out at nature, there is no such thing as waste, right? One organism's waste is another organism's food, minerals and energy and everything continually cycles through the biogeochemical cycles that our earth has. And that cycling of nutrients through, um, through the web of life is essential for its resilience and regenerative capacity. And we've done a bloody good job over the last probably since civilization, but really, really stepped it up when we started using fossil fuels and I guess started with scientific enlightenment and then kind of really ramped up with the industrial revolution. And we're kind of getting to the point now where it's like, okay, crap, uh, no longer can we consider the world as a infinite sort of bounty of resources. It could be an infinite if we base it off regenerative principles. So that's the thing. The, we have a whole lot of, um, what are those materials and things called non-renewable resources? It should be sort of a given in the name that they're non-renewable on human time scales. So probably not good to keep exponentially using them. Um, so yeah, I guess that's the, the bio-based and regenerative economy side of it is we're saying that it makes a hell of a lot of sense if we want to survive and thrive as a species going forward in perpetuity for as long as we can on Spaceship Earth. We really need to be looking towards uh, bio-based materials uh, especially for the built environment, uh, considering it's like between 30 to 35 percent of the total CO2 footprint uh, of the world uh, is, uh, I guess, essentially based around the built environment, which is pretty crazy. I had to double check those facts um, before saying that out loud. Um, and then, yeah, the regenerative economy piece, again, that's speaking to this whole concept that life has this innate capacity to create conditions conducive to life, as Janine Benyus would say. And that a regenerative economy is trying to think of things from a pluralistic perspective of value. So rather than the primary value being, uh, I guess, monetary value, or uh, we're sort of looking and going, how can we, instead of maximizing for return on investment, how can we optimize for the system as a whole? So that might be social, ecological, knowledge, capital, spiritual capital, all of these other things. I use the word capital because it's just a useful anchor, but just to guess acknowledging that axiomatically there are multiple things that we need to value rather than just money. Um, yeah, so as, as Ham also mentioned, I guess we are a circular business model as well. So we offer uh, lab space as a service and a simple product service system model. And we do this to catalyze the transition to a circular bio-based economy. And essentially a lot of these things that we're speaking to, bio-inspired design and innovation and whatnot, they, they're definitely within the margins and slowly becoming mainstream, but we exist to support them because 
conventionally there might not be the incentive structures in the traditional ways of doing things that um, I guess is in current industry or academia. Obviously there are still some people doing this. I don't want to say that that's, that's the case for everything, but the systems that we have created are part of the problem and trying to find new and novel ways to support is I guess what we feel is part of the solution. So I guess that's how we kind of operate. We offer space uh, and help a whole bunch of people doing these really awesome ideas. A lot of the time free of charge or just to try and help them get on their feet because that's the most vulnerable time when people are I guess trying to make this sort of stuff happen. So we as an organization try and operate kind of like a mycelial network that works to weave different ideas and people and things together. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what we do. There you go. That's sort of the mission, vision, values. Um, so again, we kind of act as a catalyst for all of this sort of stuff. We really see ourselves as being, I guess, the space in the middle that can hopefully <laughs> reduce as much the gap from ideation to actualization. Um, and I guess this sort of vision is heavily drawn from Fushov Capra, who's a, I guess, a living systems thinker who I um, owe a lot of my understanding about this sort of stuff to. And I guess one of his uh, sort of key quotes that really resonated with me was, was uh, sort of along these lines. So I guess what we sort of envision is a world where humanity, technology and society, um, they interface in a way in which they do not impact nature's ability to sustain life. Uh, it seems pretty obvious and pretty simple. Um, but again, as we sort of said earlier on, the issue with systemic things like this is that it's a collective coordination failure where multiple agents do what might be in their best interest. But as a whole, it means that we get a subpar thing. No one really wants to destroy the earth, right? But uh, we also like the convenience of like same day delivery and all these other sort of things. So uh, yeah, anyway, our values. So I guess, yeah, we're actively trying to reposition science as I guess a force for good and trying to weave in more these more holistic ways of thinking about science and working with it. Um, we are trying to, I guess, redefine the approach when it comes to supporting innovation. As I said, looking at doing different structures, like Bucky Fuller would say, like, and try and fight the system, design a new one that makes the old one obsolete. So looking at ways in which we can support these ideas, that's a little bit different. Um, the entrepreneurship piece, Again, just looking at that and how we can take a planet centric perspective uh, and then that last one regenerate our planet pretty self explanatory. Um, I won't bother going through these too much We've kind of sort of touched on those, but I guess we operate on this principle of business unusual and a lot of these biomaterials are a part of it. Um, this is sort of a little bit of a list of our current members. The reason why I have this here is not for a marketing ploy. It's because I want to call out a whole bunch of the biomaterial companies that we are sort of working with on here, but also show that uh, you know, there is like a wide, I guess, sort of selection of people that we support and biomaterial is one of those key pillars. We also, I guess, using the, um, that's really convenient, donor economics as a model, um, we kind of support people who are either trying to bring us within planetary boundaries or raise social foundations. So that includes things like uh, new and novel cancer diagnosis, uh, sterilization devices to remove airborne pathogens, more sustainable fishing, um, synthetic biology approaches to maybe make dyes that could replace petrochemical dyes. Uh, these are our two charities, a circular charity that um, donates old science equipment from labs to schools in need. Um, as well as like non-woven fibers from Kambungai, there's synthetic biological intelligence, there's cultivated meat. Um, so an Oz kelp, which is a kelp farm. So again, another awesome biomaterial that will be looking at getting woven into the built environment pretty soon, or already is, to be honest. So why next gen materials? Well, I kind of spoke to it just briefly there. Um, but I guess to put it pretty bluntly, we, since this sort of framework came into, I guess, existence, uh, and since we started first measuring in 2009, we kind of knew that we might have crossed a whole bunch of these planetary boundaries, which essentially are things that if we, if we go past them, we actually don't know what might happen. We're going to probably look at destabilizing planetary feedback loops and systems, which is just not good for human civilization, let alone life as uh, 
as a whole. Um, so progressively, as you can see, as we've got better at being able to measure these things, we've realized that, oh shit, we actually look like we've probably crossed six of those boundaries. Um, and why this is, a, I guess, an issue is when we start thinking about the built environment, we're not gonna have enough sand to be able to make concrete uh, and glass and all these other things. Like we're gonna hit real physical limits when it comes to the resources that we currently have, when it comes to, um, I guess, uh, looking at pulling virgin materials or resources from the earth. And we're gonna have to get way better at circulating things rather than just the take, make waste linear sort of economy. Um, so yeah, and other things like um, novel entities. So like PFAS and all these other flame retardants and things like that. Um, plastics, you know, they're sort of throughout the entire environment because nature has this funny old habit of dispersing things, um, which makes it hard to close the loop. Um, when we talk about circular economy and plastics and all this sort of stuff, it's like, realistically, we should just be getting rid of that stuff. Like as a, like as a concept, it's, it's a great idea, but <laughs> the issue is that it doesn't really, it's not really compatible with life. So that's kind of why we want to be sort of moving away from some of these sorts of things. Um, but yeah, we've also interfered with biogeochemical flows, fresh water and land system change, all these sort of things, which if you have a more, I guess, focus on regenerative materials and next gen materials, you can actually actively regenerate the land whilst generating enough materials to be able to build uh, homes, create clothes, build furniture, all of these sorts of things. So by definition, I love Materium. They're, they're one of the best um, sort of groups in the world, sort of looking at next generation materials, but next generation materials are like waste free and regenerative by design. Um, so we have kind of like a little bit of a portfolio of what these sort of next gen materials are. So this is kind of, I guess, like what you can imagine the material palette of the future will uh, sort of contain. This is like a typology. Um, so to speak. So algae, both microalgae and macroalgae are actually a amazing carbon sink. So they draw down um, ocean carbon and they also grow way quicker than terrestrial plants. And I think um, I don't want to bro science you, um, but I'd say they produce way more oxygen for us to breathe than uh, terrestrial plants, which is pretty wild when you think about it. Um, and they're also, uh, I guess, algae dying and sinking to the bottom of the ocean is a big part of what uh, actually regulates our, um, I guess, guy and feedback loops to keep Earth in a habitable zone. Um, anyway, so algae is really great. I've got some examples on a couple of other pages. We'll go through um, chitin, um, which is spelled cheating, which I, I always mistake that. Um, but this is a, another material that you commonly find in shells and other things like that. Um, and it is like, quite strong, but um, obviously can chip and break. But there are some really interesting ways in which you can mix that as a composite with other materials to get the desired results that you want. Um, mycelium is another one which I'm sure many of you will heard about. Um, There's so many different ways in which you can work with this. So mycelium is the root network and structure of fungus. Um, so, you know, obviously we know mushrooms. This is not mushrooms. This is what creates the mushrooms. Um, that is an amazing product um, that can be used for acoustic panels. It can be used as insulation. It can be used as packaging alternatives and polystyrene. There is a whole bunch of different things that um, mycelium can be used for, and it's a great, great biomaterial because uh, it can also essentially you can grow it and use what is, I guess, deemed waste, right? Mycelium are the decomposers of the natural world. That is literally their role is to extract nutrients from dead things or things that are maybe, I guess, not very much of use for, for humans. So you can also potentially grow them on old clothes, which is pretty cool. Um, so cultivated animal cells is another thing. Um, so rather than having to slaughter an animal and then skin it and then use that as a form of leather, we can actually kind of grow them in the lab. So there are a couple of companies that are working on, um, I guess what you would call uh, lab grown leather. Um, so that could be an alternative that's sort of coming through the ranks again, a couple of years away until that's really accessible right now. Um, but that will be, you know, obviously be able to use as a, as a product, as leather. And what's cool about it is you could potentially grow it to the exact specifications that you want rather than having to have any offcuts and all that sort of stuff, which is pretty cool. 
Um, yeah, other next gen materials are like so micro de microbe derived. So for example, there you've got your PHA. So just like if we eat too many donuts, we store fat. If you feed bacteria too much, certain types of bacteria too much food, they store it as PHA. It's kind of like a reservoir of energy for them. It just so happens to also be bloody good as a plastic replacement. Um, so yeah, we're doing a lot of work with PHAs at the moment. There's a few companies in Australia doing stuff as well. I think we lose one of them turning seaweed into PHA. You can also make it from, uh, I think you can feed potatoes to bacteria to do it as well. One of our other members did that as well. Great wrap. Um, uh, and then what's kind of fun as well is when you start playing with blending these composites, right? So you could blend a SCOBY, which is a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast, that stuff that you kind of get on the top of kombucha. I've got some photos of it later on, don't you worry. Um, that sort of stuff, um, you could blend that with a mycelium or with an algae or something else to get these new and novel, I say as composite materials, which are really interesting. And then another one is recycled materials. So. Again, I've got a couple of examples of all of these on the other page that I can speak to. And then your obvious ones, sort of like the plant derived. So your hemp, so that's like hemp crete, hemp bricks, um, hemp insulation. There's quite a lot that can be done with that. Um, and it's obviously really, really good as well um, for, I guess, regenerating soil. It's a really fast growing plant. It's just awesome and has so many different uses from like both food and fiber perspectives. Bamboo, fastest growing plant or grass, it's not a tree, um, super cool stuff. And straw, again, like it's one of those things that most of the time people collect it like, oh, this is kind of a waste. But yeah, straw bale homes, as I'm sure a lot of you know, it's a really useful insulator for that sort of stuff as well. Um, so here, I guess, is some fun little photos of stuff that's been happening, I guess, in and around the lab. So as I was saying for Auskelp, so we're looking at supporting the Australia's first commercial kelp farm. We're then going to be looking at ways in which we can integrate kelp into the built environment with materials. So that's really cool. Um, the next one to the right is Zeoform. So they're a startup based in New South Wales. So we're looking at collaborating with them to, um, I guess, prototype some concepts, but essentially that's a chipboard that can be, uh, they, they make them with some using paper and office waste, some saw sawdust waste, um, but with a certain sort of hemp and water and uh, I guess the right pressure and temperature, they can press this into a chipboard, sort of like a replacement for NDF. Uh, and it's like green chemistry, it's all bio-based and which is like just awesome. Um, over here, this is from a Japanese studio. I can't remember who, who exactly it was, but they essentially, this is like uh, food waste. So this is apples that have been crushed up and used as a material, which is pretty interesting. Um, so over here, this is a photo of um, great rap founders, Geordie and Julia Kay. So they were working in our space um, for a while and have sort of come up with a compostable cling wrap. So pellet wrapping, I guess, for, for um, the, the built environment is massive, right? Think about how much stuff you're getting shipped in uh, and it's wrapped in plastic or it has polystyrene, you know. So these are sort of things that biomaterials can replace. It's not just thinking about the materials that are going into the building, but like the second and third order consequences of how do you getting those materials to the site? What is the packaging? What is the processing? All of that sort of stuff is stuff to be taken into account as well. And that's why I guess we have these sort of things featured here. Uh, so this is alt leather. So they're one of our recent graduates making compostable leather from agricultural waste, non-competitive feedstocks, agricultural waste. Again, this can be used as upholstery, it can be used for a lot of different things, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is uh, Fungi Solutions, another Melbourne-based startup that we're affiliated with. So what's kind of cool about mycelium is, as you can see here, it's actually flame retardant. So that is a pretty useful, uh, and it's quite light as well. So it's actually potentially really useful for um, the built environment. There's still obviously regulations and things that all of these materials need to go through before they can start getting integrated. but that's something that we'll get to and something that we're actively trying to explore and, uh, and advocate for. Um, over here as well, we have um, Uptex. So they uh, take old clothing uh, and essentially blend it all up and heat press it together into these, uh, these, I guess, boards. Again, really good acoustic properties. So you can kind of use them. Uh, we're sort of getting them installed in our space. 
um, and then we'll be covering them with a like a hemp fabric and they'll be functioning essentially as acoustic panels. They can also be rigid and structural and used for like, um, I guess, installations and benches and things like this that you can actually have the seats that have been made out of it, which is pretty cool. Um, next up and getting into some more funky territory here. So this is super cool. So uh, I assume you've all seen butterflies and, 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 and beetles and all these sort of insects. They, you might notice that, or, or like feathers, right? The color changes depending on what angle you look at it. And that's because it's structural color. It's not a pigment. It's the protein structure of these at the, I guess the molecular level, which give off this certain color. So this is something again, probably still a couple of years away from being something commercially available, but these are dyes that are, yeah, structural dyes based on that. And that's, I guess, a really interesting way of doing coloring and pigmentation because it doesn't rely on petrochemicals, which I guess a lot of our oils, paints, dyes, and everything kind of are pretty toxic. Uh, another one, another interesting one here is the, this is a Melbourne-based designer um, who's been making these algae sheets, which are just aesthetically quite beautiful. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other properties aside from that, but I just think they look stunning and uh, definitely work for like an integration into the built environment. Um, Again, so this is um, the, I guess, uh, a mix of chitin and some other sort of biomaterials to sort of make these pots and cups. Um, and then we've got, oh, this is a great one. So down here, this is Mogu, they're out of Italy. So they're one of the, I guess, the, the first people who got into the mycelial sort of space. But so they have wall panels, they have ceiling panels, but they also have floor panels. So they've They've worked hard on creating a, a durable um, biomaterial from mycelium um, that I guess functions as a, as a floor, which is, is which is wild. I've been trying to get our hands on some samples and see if we can integrate it into some of our spaces. Um, but I believe that's commercially available now, which is well, which is pretty cool. Um, there are some other things. So this is the this is Kelson. So they make a woven fiber out of kelp. Uh, again, this is something that can be start being used in upholstery. Uh, this is available now as well. Um, this is sort of what the, the SCOBY looks like. It kind of creepily looks like skin, but is definitely not. But there's a lot of potential interesting ways in which this can be worked with in the built environment as well, um, especially if you blend it as a composite with other things, potentially with hemp and other things like that. It can make durable panels. There are a couple of projects that are working on similar sorts of things in our space at the moment. Um, over here as well, we have uh, spiva, which is brood protein. So this is actually, I guess, mimicking spider silk, um, which is kind of one of the strongest uh, proteins out there and incredibly light and durable. So that, again, that is a fiber that's out and about, but I'm not sure if it's at the commercial sort of scale yet. Uh, and this one here is just a biodegradable biopolymer. I believe this one is made from uh, PHA. Um, so that's another sort of cool one there that sort of can be starting used too. Um, cool. I mean, that's it in terms of the presentation of things that are happening, things that are sort of bubbling away. But we're going to have a discussion with Hamish where he's going to sort of ask us a bunch of questions and we're going to kind of go through some things. And if anyone has any other questions about, I guess, biomaterials in the built environment, let me know. Um, yeah, we're super keen to have a chat and see where this goes. Awesome. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, and thank you for better explaining uh, exactly what Colabs does. Like, I do have a few questions here. And, and as Sam said, if, if anyone has any questions, queries, comments, please pop them in the chat uh, and we'll try and get to them. Um, tell us uh, some of the most promising biomaterials currently in development and uh, how do you think they're expected to transform the construction industry? Yeah, that's, um, that's a good one. As I, as I sort of went through in the slide, I do think that um, hemp is going to be one of the biggest things. As you're already seeing it sort of come through, people are familiar with this already, um, but starting to see it coming in as a replacement for chipboard and stuff like that, I think that's a bit more new and novel. Um, but I do really feel like hemp is something that is, we're only going to see more and more and more of this as a building material as it comes through. Um, and again, as I said, the other one I think that really is going to be um, a big mover will be um, mycelium. So whether that is as acoustic treatment or 
panels or anything of the likes or whether it's going to be used as an insulation or whether that's going to be something that you're going to be having things rock up at like for imagine like um like a dura panel or something like that or any of these sorts of things that we have that might have a have a core like imagine being able to replace that and have a fully sort of biocomposite in there that's sort of where i feel there's a lot of stuff beginning to emerge there. And as I said, there's already things that are on the market with fungi solutions locally. And um, I know Ecovative and a couple of other people, Mogu are sort of working on that sort of stuff. Um, so there is there is a lot of precedent for these sorts of things. But I do really think that some awesome stuff that I think I actually skipped over one of them is um, things like biocement and biocrete. So working with microorganisms to mimic the ways in which um, in biological systems. So essentially like the formation of calcium carbonate and the formation of limestones. So lime obviously being a key ingredient in concrete. So we can actually work with living systems to emulate that sort of thing under certain conditions. And just, as I said before, given the fact that, you know, there's so much concrete that's constantly going into everything and we have a shortage of sand I really do feel like um, biomineralization and being able to use that as a way to create a sustainable uh, feedstock for concrete, uh, I think that's going to be massive. Um, I just don't think that it's, there are people over, so there's Biomason overseas who are doing it. Um, locally, there's a few people I know, there's a couple of synthetic biologists interested. I'm not sure if anything's happening just yet. But I do really feel like that's going to be massive. Um, and as well with like algae bricks, sort of, I think I kind of brushed over it as well. But there are people looking at going, you can use seaweed. So the algae can be macro algae and micro algae, but you can use seaweed as, as a, like as a thatched roof, which is pretty wild. I've seen it being used as a thatched roof. Also really good for acoustic properties. Um, and it can be, I guess, molded into a brick um which is pretty cool as well i've seen some people doing that i'm not sure how far away the bricks are um but yeah i mean look there's so many amazing things i think another one i didn't touch on but i know we've had a chat with about before hamish is um there's this concept of like thermochromic paint so hypothetically you could paint your roof so that when it's cold it will absorb heat and it'll be black and then when it heats up it actually goes transparent and so underneath you could have a white surface. So that'll increase the albedo effect, which means that you're gonna be reflecting more heat rather than absorbing it and cooling the house down. So there's quite an array of amazing sort of things that are beginning to emerge, um, which is really exciting. Um, I would also imagine that the, the, the bricks, the kelp bricks or the algae bricks um, would probably also have like a, a pretty good heat resistance and thermal mass as well. So I, you know, obviously someone a lot smarter than me would have to, I guess, run a um, a calculation on its thermal performance. But I'd also imagine that it would actually add to the R value of a, of a wall builder. Now, my mind, knowing, having built a hempcrete house before, and having have built uh, a couple of alternate tenant buildings using different products that are kind of that sit outside our construction code performance solutions and regulations and all that kind of stuff is going to come into uh, play here. Um, how do you see the construction industry navigating through that? Um, and I guess what changes would you like to see to help facilitate this? Because I'd imagine it would be people like our audience who would be interested in using these things, but I'd imagine there's going to be a lot of hurdles to get over before we can actually use them in like the mainstream. Absolutely. And I think this is one of the biggest things where, and I'm just going to straight out admit it. Um, I don't know the complete answer. I think it's going to be a mix of things, both top down um, in terms of regulatory sort of stuff, but also bottom up from people going, Hey, you know, we know we want to be using these sorts of things. Realistically, with things like regulation, I feel like there might even be force functions. So, for example, we're starting to see things like PFAS and plastics where it's like, okay, cool, like we, we, we know these things are toxic and bad for us now. So, you know, if, if you blanket ban things like that, there has to be a quick response. But we need to be ensuring that we have stuff in the background that is ready to go when that happens. So a prime example of that was um, 
I guess, I, I think it was, was it Sri Lanka? Where they just like overnight banned synthetic fertilizers and then they had a massive food famine. There was another place where they just banned plastic bags overnight um, and then the whole sort of country went into chaos for a, for a week or two and then they had to unban them. So I guess the issue with the regulation is that it needs to be one step ahead but not banning things before there's already the infrastructure in place to be able to do this at scale. So I think to be able to make these things come to market, yes, the regulatory play is super important, but realistically we need a like an investment from um, the government. So for example, the National Reconstruction Funds just come out, um, you know, there are other sort of avenues, but realistically the government should be looking at cultivating and helping support sovereign manufacturing capabilities. Um, as well as industry should be uh, would would be nice if industry was sort of looking at coming to the table and trying to support more of this R and D as well, like internally, um, and obviously you know, we're going to need a lot more research on it. But I really do think the infrastructure play, supported by super funds, supported by the government, and then having industry come in and do challenge led innovation around these sort of areas is key. So this is stuff that we're actively addressing. So what well, in I guess. At Colas, we call this systemic innovation. So looking at ways in which we can make that happen and how do we use catalytic capital from that's both public and private. So there's a lot of super funds. They're investing all of our money into our futures, right? So you probably want that to be something that is going to ensure that a thriving future for everyone. So that can mean looking at going and saying to them, well, from an ESG perspective, investing in this infrastructure to allow people to scale this up is a really good idea. You look at going to the government, this is obviously going to be a key area that we're going to be needing to support. And then if you want to be hitting your net zero emissions, they can start doing challenge led innovation, which we're starting to see. So um, that actually has happened recently. We just applied for a bid to create more sustainable wine bottles using kelp um, as, a, as a sort of biopolymer. So there is we're beginning to see this challenge led innovation approach, um, which I think was championed by Mariana Mazzacuso, who is, I think, an Italian uh, economist uh awesome awesome woman um but yeah i think it's going to be a mix of um incentivization top down bottom up um and yeah there i don't think there is an answer a, a perfect answer for it because there's always going to be perverse incentives that um are like the things the way they are and there's also going to be locked in because you know this is what you're familiar with right as well it's like it's not all um just because people are try trying to be bad it's like if you're familiar with a certain thing and you know how it performs under certain contexts why would you replace this other thing if it costs more and might not be as durable or you haven't worked with it? There's that fear of the unknown. So I think there's also a big education piece around what this is, how it works. It might not necessarily be a direct drop in, but more of like a uh, like a Venn diagram of what this kind of overlays and could be used as a similar sort of substitute. I'd also, um, I'd also say that it's people in our audience uh, championing these new products and actually putting them into the market so there's an actual t uh, a tested product out there that people can reference to. Um, I've got a question here from uh, one of our other directors, Jeremy. Um, do you envisage our buildings of the future just bio de like degrading when uh, a lifespan is over? So imagine like, you know, my love huts just... Well, I mean, if you look at it, like that's what that's how all of our built environment was based, um, you know, 10,000 years ago. And in some places around the world, it's still like that. I mean, I don't know like, if anyone here has seen the book Low Tech, right, um, designed by radical indigenism, but like so much of the built environment that we've been working with for time immemorial is exactly that. You just build something and it degrades at the end of life and goes back and releases its nutrients into the world. I mean, there's something to be said for, I mean, aspiring towards that, like all things must come to an end, so to speak. But there is also this need for durability. <laughs> like you probably don't want to be building like a 10 story skyscraper that's going to biodegrade in 10 years. Um, so there is this balance. And I, I think it's, a, it's going to be a dynamic tension between how do we ensure these things are, are going to last as long as possible. And that's why things like the self healing bacterial concrete is quite an interesting sort of concept uh, and trying to do our best to work with these materials that can self regenerate as well. Um, but I do think that it would be great if that was something that could happen under the right conditions. 
Um, and then I just think that like any sort of, so if you've got a timber chopping board, you've got anything like that, right? To maintain it, you need to coat it, you know, with a mineral oil or something else to ensure that it can keep performing. You know, back in the day, we used to have waxed coats. So you would have a cotton waxed canvas coat and you had to keep maintaining it to keep it waterproof. I think thinking along those sorts of lines, like having to maintain things and have a relationship like that with it, designing it for disassembly, designing for decomposition, modular homes and housing, like all of these sorts of things are, I guess, going to be coming to the forefront when we have, I guess, material scarcity or, or things like that. Um, but yeah, it would be pretty cool to think about how buildings could be designed for decomposition at the end of life. Um, that'd be very fascinating. I don't, I don't want to get out of the bag too early, but um, we're in discussions at the moment with Yust Backer to come on and give a presentation, uh, hopefully in a couple of months. And um, I'd actually love him to talk about uh, the testing he's been doing the CSIRO with his hemp board and Jura panel. Uh, so, you know, may, maybe not everything um, being completely biodegradable, but maybe reusable or recyclable is, uh, I guess, another another angle. Um, now, Jeremy also asked, uh, are there any solutions coming from single-use plastics? Um, perhaps he missed uh, the um, bioplastic. Yeah, so, so do, do you want to repeat that again? I think I Yeah, heard... so, so, so Jeremy, Jeremy was asking, are there um, solutions coming for single-use plastics that yes. lack many building products? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the stuff that I showed you before, like Great Wrap, so that, this is stuff that's already on the market right now. You can go and buy it from their website. So they're one of our alumni um, that they saw this as a massive problem. So he was a winemaker and she was an architect. Um, they were kind of getting all this stuff rocking up at site and being like, it's all like wrapped in plastic. And like you, all that, the only duration that that thing needs to last for is, is from being like packed through to like the logistics cycle, right? Getting transported and then delivered to the site and then you're ripping it off. Why are we using something that can last for a thousand years in the environment if it's not biodegraded? Like it's pointless. So I guess they saw that as a as a fun uh, challenge to tackle. And yeah, they came up with great wrap. So it's I think they use potato potato waste and PHA to create this. Uh, and yeah, that's so. There's something here now. You can go and use it. There are other people sort of looking at working on this as well across the globe. But um, it's very feasible to use cellulose or algae or kombucha or scoby to, I guess, replace this single use packaging. Um, and I think that's their best use cases because then again, you know, they are designed to decompose and to break down and they can last that amount of time that they need to. Uh, and then the other one would be, as I said, like styrofoam replacements, because that's just, that's everywhere in the built environment as well. And that's where the mycelium sort of comes in as a really good drop in for that. You can. You can grow that, um, you know, within a week you can grow um, like all of the packaging you would need to be able to, you know, bring in something. Um, so that is also being scaled up right now. There are a lot of people working on that sort of stuff. And I think you should probably expect to see that sort of seeping out into the space uh, sooner rather than later as it begins to sort of reach the scale at which it can penetrate the market a little bit more. I'm, I'm imagining a, a structurally insulated panel with, um, you know, bio board with mycelium core in it. I mean, that would just be uh, incredible. And just getting back to the to the plastic, my memory serves me correctly. Uh, Zach Efron's Netflix series that was based in Australia actually visited that uh, factory Great, with the plastic. So I don't know. I can't remember the name of the uh, the sh the show. But I guess if you just Google Zac Efron on Netflix, it'll come up. Kiss and, yeah, the Ground or something? I, I can't. Uh, I'm trying to act like I might not have I, seen one episode. I'm like, yeah. Hey, hey, you know what? Big fan, Zach. If you want to come on, let me know. Yeah. Um, so um, biomaterials, I mean, these things are going to come at a cost. I think what, what's actually going to get this stuff into the, uh, into the market is if, if we've got like a cost comparison between what we're used to and, you know, what – these products are going to come to the market with like at the moment i would imagine that these products are going to be a little bit more expensive but can you see a future where these new biomaterials are going to be on par with the cost of the current building materials yeah look it's one of those things where um 
whether it's in the short term or the long term, we're going to hit those hard limits for, so, that I was speaking about. And there's going to be regulation coming in around petrochemicals and plastics and this sort of stuff that will make make this, uh, I guess, where, where am I going with this? Money or like all of this sort of stuff tends to follow the path of least resistance or the, the, the cheapest possible solution that fits the bill, right? So we're kind of at a point now where they're starting to come up and the innovations are starting to be quicker. But as I said, it's really ensuring that we have all the infrastructure and everything in place to support it. Currently, um, a lot of these things are slightly more expensive, but as they start getting the support and as they start getting the funding, that should be price parity, if not below. But realistically, like we say this to everyone who comes through wanting to work on these sorts of things, realistically, it has to be cheaper, better, <laughs> uh, like better performing and like aesthetically pleasing as well. Right. And and that might sound unreasonable to sort of make that happen. But I, I realistically think when you are working across a holistic sort of value and looking at all of these other sort of benefits, especially with like more and more, um, I guess, millennials and Gen Z's entering the sort of space. And obviously they're going to be looking at purchasing or building homes over the next decade or two you're going to see more people who are willing to sort of flesh out a little bit more to be able to use these sorts of things. And I think that it really depends on how you perceive, as I said before, it really depends on how you perceive value, right? In the short term, it might be cheaper to go get that petrochemical plastic thing, right? But with the off-gassing of volatile chemicals that are going to then create a, a, a worse air environment, like because you're in a passive house, you know, that thing is a sealed box. You know, you're trying to make that as like tight as possible so that you can regulate the the i guess the the temperature and everything inside but you know if that has a plastic lining or um or what have you that's in the walls then you're just creating an environment inside that's actually more toxic in the air than it would be outside so it really depends on what you value uh, and then and in the long term i do feel like it's gonna it's the more sustainable choice but again if we're going to have to reassess what we what we what we value and if we want things to be quick and convenient we're going to keep going down this sort of petrochemical route if we want things to be sustainable longer lasting you know it's going to be intentional design decisions and choices and we're going to need the early adopters to then sort of come on board and and, and validate that and make make that demand available and then support from government and all these sort of other things to be able to bring that price down but eventually it's going to get there definitely I mean, one of the narratives we have with our clients in pre-construction, and excuse me if I'm bringing it back to me, but, you know, it is a nice example. Um, we talk about cost of performance and cost of build, and it's all about educating the client of, like, where they see value in the costs. And I'd imagine it'd be the same thought process when you're purchasing maybe a biomaterial that might be a little bit more expensive. So it's cost of build, cost of the planet. So, you know, your ledger might be weighed more towards you know, what the impact is to the planet. So you're actually prepared to spend a little bit more money on that. So, and we're experiencing that too with the homes that we're building, particularly with the Hempcrete house. Like I knew we could have built that cheaper. There is definitely cheaper ways to build that home. But, you know, we need champions like, you know, my clients who wanted to build a Hempcrete house. Um, we talked, you touched on health just then. So how could you, how are you seeing uh, biomaterials creating a more healthier ecosystem within a home? Yeah, oh, man, there's so many, so many great answers to that. Um, so obviously, like at the human level, so like if we start there, if you're working with natural materials, I mean, not, and first of all, I want to caveat that not all natural materials are great. Cyanide is a natural material, prime example of something that will kill you. So it's not that an indigo is, is a natural material and is highly toxic. So it's not that all natural materials are good. But if we're looking at, you know, designing intentionally with that in mind and acknowledging that um, what we build and the environments we create then shape and create us um, and our, I guess, health and well being, I guess thinking of things and it's not just the the physical forms or the materials that we use but also the space that we create with them so are we doing biophilic and biomimetic design and architecture or are we just doing a square box with no windows or 
No, so thinking about the shapes and things that we're weaving in like a lot more organic forms and this sort of stuff, like that's what we're so familiar with as human beings. That's why when we go out in nature, our stress levels drop, you know, like being able to hear bird song, um, you know, being able to have sunlight come in and touch your skin, all of these sort of things are really important for your health and well-being, right? So, you know, if we're designing a home, that can be a habitat. If you've got a green roof or if you're looking at integrating things so that you there's actually space for birds to coexist with you and suddenly you've got that bird song around all the time and suddenly your stress levels are dropping you know if we're starting to design buildings like a forest you know where they're generating energy where they're purifying water capturing the water that falls on the on the roof and and storing that for use later on um and purifying the air like you can you can you can build these buildings in that sort of way and i think that that ultimately it's not only just good for humans what you're doing is also factoring in the more than human world so how does this relate to the uh i guess the ecology or the environment within which this house is contextually situated how can we work with materials that are locally sourced or or something like that that can sort of mirror and reflect that and and again all of these sorts of things um the aesthetics of something yeah it feels good to be in and around it and then that actually shapes your i guess your emotional state and the way in which you relate to yourself and to others and there's sort of positive flow and effects from all of this but it's all i guess that's the thing that we always say it's all interconnected and interrelated and if you're building a healthy home with healthy materials you yourself are obviously going to be feeling more healthy even if your bank account's a little bit less healthy to begin with it's going to be more healthy in the long term and future generations will thank you for it Absolutely. And look, Jeremy has chimed in again. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, uh, embodied carbon is probably going to come into the code in the next decade. So um, Mate, that's where biomaterials and win. Yeah, absolutely. It's going, to help, it, it, it's going to help drive the market. Now, I am conscious of time. Full disclosure, I am going to the football tonight. Um, so <laughs> I, want to, I do want to finish on time. Um, Sam, thank you so much uh, for coming on today. And I know you and I were chatting today that um, you know, we're now doing little mini sods that are about 10 to 15 minutes and it'd be great to have some of uh, the organisations or the companies that have come through Labs to come on and present about their biomaterials. I think actually seeing that stuff in practice uh, could be super interesting for the viewers. So we will, we will pick up that conversation again um, soon. Sounds um, great. But a big thanks to everyone for coming along today. I know this is kind of a little, may seem like a little bit of, a, of an out there topic and, you know, hopefully you can understand why we've we got, the, uh, got Sam on today because it is going to become a big part of our um, built environment very soon, if not already there. Um, again, big, big thanks to uh, our one of our platinum sponsors, um, Bradford's. You know, hopefully they're going to take a leaf out of your book soon, Sam, and come knocking on the door and uh, develop some bio uh, claddings. Uh, don't forget to check out our latest episode of the Sustainable Builders Yak, um, where Simon and Brian are talking about concrete-free uh, footings with David Singh from uh, Shorefoot. Um, if you haven't already checked out our YouTube channel, uh, jump on there uh, and check out the mini-sodes and, and the full episodes. Of course, they sit on our website, so www.dsba.com.au. Um, next month's webinar is a really, really cool one. Um, speaking of biomaterials, well, kind of, we've actually got Darren from Craftsman Hardwood coming on to talk about this. This is a laminated uh, bit of timber. So this mm. is from a company by 3RT. Now, what's really cool about this is that it puts together layers of timber to mimic timber, but the glue is actually biotechnology that uh, um, mimics lignin that is what sticks together timber. And Sam, you could probably explain that a lot yeah, better no, than me. In, you're, you're, in, you're in the natural on. environment. Yeah, it's in a natural it's, environment. Yeah, this is one that I forgot to mention. I didn't mention it, but uh, that's so great that this is coming on next. But yeah, this is another awesome invention. Coming on coming on next. And also um, to, to anyone in South Australia, we are hopefully organising a tour of their factory in August. So keep a, keep a look out for that.
but this is really cool. You know, they they, they can grow a hundred year log in one day in their factory. So this is going to be really cool. Um, again, thank you, Sam, for coming along. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining today. And uh, Sam, we will we will chat very soon. Mate, looking forward to it. Um, yeah, thanks right. so much for the opportunity. No worries. Take care. See you.